This session is going to be a quick review for the ecology test. I can't promise you that we'll cover every question that's going to be on the test, but this would be a great starting point for your studying. Let's we'll start with the energy pyramid. This is the energy pyramid that we looked at before. The bottom, we have the producers. Producers are also known as autotrophs. Okay, producers or autotrophs are able to get their energy from the sun through the process of photosynthesis. There's more energy found in the energy pyramid in the producer section than there is in the rest of the, of the energy pyramid. Moving up from the producers, we have the consumers. The consumers is anything that's not able to make its own food. So these are the consumers. Consumers are also known as heterotrophs. These primary consumers eat solely the producers or autotrophs. We've also heard these called herbivores before. The secondary consumers are the consumers that are willing to eat the primary consumers or each other. So these are meat eaters. We call these carnivores. And you can tell the difference between primary consumers and secondary consumers by their teeth. Primary consumers are going to have more peg-like teeth for grinding of the uh, plant material, where the secondary consumers are going to have sharper teeth that have been uh, selected to be able to consume uh, the primary consumers and each other. At the very top, we have the tertiary consumers. These are the apex predators. These are the top of the food chain. Remembering that for each section that we go up on the food pyramid, we lose 10%, uh, down to 10% of the energy. So if we had 10,000 kcals of energy here, here we would have a thousand kcals, here we would have a hundred, and here we would have ten kcals of energy. So there's less energy at the top and a smaller population than there is in the bottom. Moving forward, we're going to talk about invasive species. Okay, invasive species are a problem because they don't belong in the ecosystem that they've moved into. They have no natural enemies and so they grow out of control. This is kudzu found in the south. We originally brought it over in the 1800s to help with uh, erosion from Japan. In Japan there are insects that eat kudzu and so keep it in check. This is actually a house that's been overgrown by kudzu. So kudzu grows over a foot a day and has no natural enemies. When this kudzu overgrows the, the, uh, the natural vegetation that's there, it blocks out the sunlight causing the natural vegetation to die. All the ecosystem that is based on that vegetation, the insect life, the things that eat the insect life, they no longer have a food source until there's only one species left in this ecosystem, that's kudzu. This is the lionfish, native to Pacific Oceans. We're starting to see that now in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a voracious hunter and is outcompeting the fish that would normally be found in the Gulf of Mexico for food. And so there's fear that this may become a more dominant predator in the Gulf of Mexico and get rid of uh, the competition that it has in the more native species. Okay, now we're going to talk about symbiotic relationships. Symbiotic relationships are those very close relationships between two different species. This type of relationship right here, this is a tick on a human. This is a, an example of parasitism. Okay. In this case, the human is the host, which is where the tick is living on, and the tick is the parasite. In parasitism, one species is harmed while one is helped. In this case, in all cases in parasitism, the host is harmed, and in this case it's the human, and the parasite is helped. Okay. This is mutualism. Mutualism is when both species are benefited. These birds eat the parasites off of the cattle and the cattle are getting the parasite removed. So they get food and they get their parasites removed. So both are benefited in a mutualistic relationship. And finally we have commensalism. In commensalism, one species is benefited while the other has no impact. The Spanish moss is given a place to live on the tree, but the tree suffers no uh, help or harm from the Spanish moss growing on it. This is commensalism. So one helped, one unaffected. Okay, let's talk for a second about biotic versus abiotic factors. 
Okay, biotic factors, bio meaning life, are the uh, organic or the, the living uh, factors in an ecosystem. Here we may talk about the shrimp that are living in these waters. Perhaps we're talking about some of the oysters, some of the insects that may find their way into these cracks and crevices of these rocks. These would be the biotic factors in this ecosystem. Birds that come and eat these oysters and shrimp. Abiotic factors in an ecosystem would be the non-living factors in an ecosystem. Now it's very common that people, as soon as we say non-living, think the rock is the abiotic factor. And the rock is one abiotic factor. But for abiotic, I also want you to be thinking about things like, what is the air temperature here? What about the amount of salt in the water? How about the water itself? What about the winds that come in in different times of the day, in different times of the year? These are all abiotic factors. And they certainly have an impact on the biotic life that we would find here. Okay, let's talk about the predator-prey graph. Here we see we have a graph that shows a bunny population and a fox population. You see that the bunny population will spike. When the bunny population begins to spike, after that the fox population will follow. Once the bunny population has been uh, uh, eaten by the fox population, it begins to fall. And once it falls, the fox population trails after it. So you have the prey leading the way for the graph for the predator. Okay, finally, we have a, an example of a food web. When we look at the bottom of the food web, okay, we find our autotrophs. Notice the direction the arrows go. We like to say that the arrows point into the mouth of the organism that is eating them. So the energy, if you follow the food web, goes from the grass into the rabbit, from the rabbit into the snake. In this case, we can see that the apex predator, we have several tertiary predators. We have the mountain lion, and we have the hawk. Okay? If we were to have some kind of a disease that got rid of the rabbits, we would know that the mountain lions would suffer. Their numbers would decrease because they would be losing a food source. The shrubs, on the other hand, would have less eating them, and so the population of shrubs would increase. So this food web is just what it says, is a web is interrelated. Here you can see that we have fungi listed on this one. Fungi are an example of decomposers. Decomposers break down any of the dead material found in the ecosystem.